Hello, welcome to my channel. This is History with Kate. I will be talking about moments in history. So today I will be talking about Australia. I usually have my main channel, which is Crime, History and Mayhem, but I wanted to just talk about history because I just love it. So anyway, history is my thing. And Australia is a beautiful country filled with many beautiful people descended from cultures all over the world. There is unique and magnificent wildlife and they have an amazing array of wilderness from beaches, deserts to tropical forests. And most importantly, Australia is home to the oldest living civilization in the world with continuous roots dating back tens of thousands of years. Since the European invasion of Australia in 1788, the Aboriginal people have been oppressed into a world unnatural to their existence, a way of life that had continued for thousands of years. First came the influx of the strangers who carried with them diseases which killed so many of their Sydney tribes. It is estimated that over 750,000 Aboriginal people inhabited Australia in 1788. The colonists were led to believe that the land was no one's land, despite what Lieutenant James Cook saw in 1770 during his voyage up the east coast of Australia. They were so ignorant. They thought there was only one race on the earth and that was the white race. They were wrong. So when Captain Cook first came, when Lieutenant James Cook first set foot on Wangal land over at Kundal, which is now called Kurnal, he said, oh, let's put up a flag somewhere because these people are illiterate. They don't have any fences. They didn't understand. Aboriginal people didn't need fences. That they stayed for six to eight weeks, then they moved somewhere else where there was plenty of tucker and bush medicine and they kept moving and then came back in 12 months time when the food was all refreshed. It would not be an exaggeration to claim that the island continent was owned by over 400 different nations at the time of this claim by Cook. For thousands of years prior to the arrival of the Europeans, Northern Sydney was occupied by different Aboriginal clans. Living primarily along the foreshores of the harbour, they fished and hunted in the waters and hinterlands of the area and harvested food from the surrounding bush. They were self-sufficient and harmonious. They had no need to travel far from their lands since the resources about them were so abundant and trade with other tribal groups was well established. They were onto something. They've been there for so long. Moving throughout their country in accordance with the seasons, people only needed to spend about four to five hours per day working to ensure their survival. With such a large amount of leisure time available, they developed a rich and complex ritual life language, customs, spirituality, and the law, the heart of which was connection to the land. The arrival of James Cook in 1770 marked the beginning of the end for this ancient way of life. He came and he ruined it all. Cook's voyage of exploration had sailed under instructions to take possession of the southern continent if it was uninhibited or with consent of the natives if it was occupied. Yeah, he didn't do that. Either way, it was to be taken. Kind of what happened here in New Zealand. So I'm a New Zealander, but I'm also an Australian citizen because my dad's Australian. I've lived back and forth New Zealand, Australia. That's why I wanted to tell this story. I will be telling New Zealand stories as well at some stage. So upon his arrival, James declared the land he called New South Wales to be the property of Britain's King George III and ignored the inconvenient fact that the land was already well populated. His failure to even attempt to gain the consent of the natives began the legal fiction that Australia was waste and unoccupied. James was followed soon enough by the arrival of the first fleet in January of 1788 under the command of Captain Arthur Phillip whose mission was to establish a penal colony and take control of Australia for settlement. 
Captain Arthur said. We found the natives tolerable as we advanced up the river and even at the harbour's mouth we had reason to conclude the country more populous than Mr Cook thought it. There you go. For on the supplies arrival in the Botany Bay on the 18th of the month they assembled on the beach of the south shore to the number of not less than 40 persons shouting and making many signs and gestures. It was probably them telling them to go away, honestly. The first act of land ownership by Europeans came within four days of arrival when a group of men from the HMS Sirius went ashore to clear land and gain access to fresh water. So by the 26th of January, the first fleet had found its way to Sydney Cove and landed there on the harbour. The early Europeans took a dim view of the Aboriginal life, way of life, when they first encountered it. It was noted that the Europeans said, it does not appear that these poor creatures have any fixed habitation, sometimes sleeping in a cavern of rock, which they make as warm as an oven by lighting a fire in the middle of it. They will take up their abode here. For one night perhaps, then in another for the next night. At other times, and we believe mostly in summer, they take up their lodgings for a day or two in a miserable wigwam, wigwam, which they made from bark of a tree. They are dispersed about the woods near the water, two, three, four together. Some oyster cockle and mussel shells lie about the entrance of them, but not in any quantity to indicate they make these huts their constant habitation. But for Aboriginal people, and in this instance, the clans living on the northern shores of Sydney, nothing could be further from the truth. What the early colonists never understood, and perhaps what many Australians are only now beginning to grasp, was that the Aboriginal lifestyle was based on total kinship with the natural environment. Wisdom and skills obtained over the millennia enabled them to use their environment to the maximum. For the Aboriginal people, acts such as killing animals for food or building a shelter where it's steeped in ritual and spirituality and carried out in perfect balance with their surroundings. For Aboriginal people, Australia has been there from the first sunrise and their people have been there along with the continent with the first sunrise. They know the land and they believe they have a sacred duty to protect the land and they believe they have a sacred duty to protect the animals that have an affiliation with them. Food was abundant, as was fresh water and shelter. Everything needed for a fruitful, healthy life was readily available. But it was not to remain this way. Because of those goddamn British settlers. The British arrival brought armed conflict and a lack of understanding, which led to the deaths of many along the northern Sydney clans, along with the other peoples of the Sydney Basin. Food shortages, food shortages soon became a problem. The large white population depleted the fish by netting huge catches reduced the kangaroo population with unsustainable hunting, cleared the land and polluted the water. As a result, the Aboriginal people throughout the Sydney Basin were soon close to starvation. Disease struck a fatal and extensive blow to the Aboriginal people who until that point had been isolated for thousands of years from diseases that had raged through Europe and Asia. They had no resistance to the deadly viruses carried by the sailors and convicts such as smallpox, syphilis and influenza. A lot of convicts were sent to Australia. In less than a year, over half the indigenous population living in the Sydney basin had died from smallpox. The region, once alive with a vibrant mix of Aboriginal clans, now file silent. 
it is difficult to comprehend how devastating this event was to the Ab Ab Aboriginal clans of the Sydney area. One tribe had been reduced to only three people and those witnessing could not remain unmoved. The colonists had destroyed within months a way of life that had outlasted British history by tens of thousands of years and the people soon realised that the trespassers were committed to nothing less than total occupation of the land. The, to most settlers, the Aboriginal people were considered to be like kangaroos, dingoes and emus. Nothing more than strange fauna to be eradicated to make way for the de development of farming and grazing. They were horrible. Not the Aboriginals, the Europeans. <laughs> I'm allowed to say that, I'm white. <laughs> It was said that there was no harm in shooting a native. It was no different than shooting a wild dog. Like, how could they say that? That is disgusting. That is disgusting. The European people would just shoot the Aboriginal people as they wished. Despite these impacts, Aboriginal, fought, Aboriginal people fought a war for many years. In a place renamed Woodford Bay by the settlers, a stockade was built in 1790 to protect timber and grass cutters from attacks by local clans. Attacks had been mounted against the British elsewhere. However, the eradication for the most part had been easy. Smallpox had destroyed more than half the population and those not ravaged by disease were displaced when land was cleared for settlements and farms. Horrible. So bad. Oh my god. Dispossessed of the land that had nourished them for so long, the Aboriginal people became dependent on white food and clothing. Alcohol used as a means of trade by the British served to further shatter traditional social and family structures. Because the vast majority of clans living in the Sydney Basin were killed as a result of the 1788 invasion, the stories of the land have been lost forever. Much of what we do know about the Northern Sydney clans must be gleaned from their archaeological, archaeological remains. Shelters, engravings and art remnants of indigenous life are prolific throughout the region, but no one remains to reveal their particular meanings or ancient significance. There are no first-hand witness accounts giving the Aboriginal perspective to what was happening. Aboriginal history has been handed down in ways of stories, dances, myths and legends. In the metropolitan area of Sydney there are thousands of Aboriginal sites, over a thousand just in the AHO partner council areas. These sites are under threat every day from development, vandalism and natural erosion. The sites cannot be replaced, and once they are destroyed, they are gone forever. Sad. The Aboriginal people who once occupied the area left important evidence of their past and way of life before colonisation. All Aboriginal sites are significant to Aboriginal people because they are evidence of the past they are evidence of the past Aboriginal occupation of Australia and are valued as a link with their traditional culture. Now I'm going to talk about a big problem in Australia and that's Australia Day. And I'm allowed to do this because my dad's Australian, I know I'm Kiwi but my dad's Australian and I am actually an Australian citizen and I lived there probably like half of my childhood. So we cannot continue to ignore the vast and ancient history in celebrations of Australia. Aboriginal culture ought to be celebrated as centrally Australian. It shouldn't be isolated from it or hidden in the background. The original custodians of the land shouldn't still be discriminated against and swept under the rug. So the issues won't 
end with a change of date but it's a bloody good place to start how do indigenous people feel about australia day there is quite obviously a fundamental problem with founding a country that already had a large population of people with a rich and ancient culture in fact i can't stress enough that australia hosts the most ancient culture of human beings on the planet this is why often protesters will suggest that that day actually represents invasion day and should not be a celebration of australian culture at all it's time we stop allowing arrogance to dilute the beautiful indigenous culture and pay attention to what aboriginal pe people are telling us did you know that australia day celebration back in 1938 was marked as a day of mourning by our indigenous folks and this protest is what led to the invasion day title and here we are over 80 years later and we still can't work out what's so offensive about celebrating a day that led to over 200 years of oppression and discrimination of the First Nations people. There is still a big difference between how Australians and those who identified as Indigenous view the date of the day. With the results of a poll concluded, conducted, not concluded, conducted for the um, Guardian showing that white Australians associate the day with the words barbecue, celebration and holiday. Among indigenous people participating in the poll, their three most chosen words were invasion, survival and murder. It is about time indigenous people were heard and they were, and they were respected, understood and celebrated. Even though the poll mentioned above re revealed that only 15% of participating Australians want the date changed, it's important to remember that the majority should not always be the authority. When a genocide has occurred, it is no longer appropriate to rely on polling to decide what a nation should do about events, dates or monuments that are directly related to that genocide. Of course the majority of Australians feel positively or indifferent about the date of Australia Day. Early settlers of Australia made sure that their Indigenous Australians are a minority in the country. They made sure their voices were silenced. That's what a genocide does. It is our responsibility to reflect on that and on all the damage that has been being caused to these indigenous cultures and to make steps towards reconciliation and correcting the discrimination. It's time for Australia as a country to grow up and respect our First Nations peoples, their voices, their cultures, their opinions. And the majority of them want the date changed. This would be a fantastic way to set up a generation of Australians that are founded on respect, not on bullying people out of the conversation with the old majority rules idea when such a vote doesn't look into the bigger picture and the historical significance of the matter. Besides, a change of date is a very small sacrifice to make to ensure the Indigenous people feel heard and respected. But what can I as an individual do? My voice and your voice do matter. It always matters. Whatever issue you're discussing, try to add your voice to the side calling for respect and compassion, not the side causing offence. Your voice is a powerful thing, so use it. My dad is Australian and I am a New Zealander, but also an Australian citizen. So I speak to my fellow Australian people. Self-reflect on your ideas and behaviour, even though it's hard. Ask yourself, why are you doing the things you're doing? <clears throat> why are you saying the things you're saying? Is it self-serving or is it in the interests of the whole community? This Australia Day 
have one or two conversations with people around you as to why you don't think Australia Day should be on this date. Share an article on your social media. Attend an event that celebrates Indigenous culture instead of falling into the beer and barbecue trap. I know it's yum, beer and barbecue, delicious, but you can do that any day. I dream of a day when a celebration of the Australian nation involves a richness, when it is something all our people can enjoy and something we can learn and grow from, not something shallow and bleak. Don't celebrate the death of many Aboriginal people, please. Okay, so that's me for today. <laughs> wow. I'm expecting some hate on this one, but you know what? I don't give a shit. <laughs> so I'm Kate. Nice to meet you guys. This is my first video for my history channel. I have a my first channel, which is Crime, Mystery and Mayhem. I talk about true crime stories. A bit different. <laughs> but I have always loved history. History has always been my thing. I love it. It was my best subject at school. So I have decided to start a second channel, which is this one. And hopefully you guys will enjoy what I have to say because I am an opinionated woman <laughs> so yeah you either love me or you hate me really alrighty so I'm gonna go now um, I hope you guys have a wonderful morning day night whatever it is where you are and I will be talking to you later please remember to like and subscribe to my channel